Hello and welcome to the world of diagnostics. Reliability. How exact does my test measure what it measures? Let's suppose you are interested in your own intelligence score. Therefore, you visit a psychologist to have an intelligence testing and after working on different tasks, you finally get your score, which is, well, because it's you, it's probably above average. So let's suppose your score is 120, which is clearly above average and a really good score. Maybe the psychologist is going to tell you not only your score, but also the so-called confidence interval. Which means he tells you, well, your score is 120, but as there is always some kind of measurement error, at the rate of 95%, your score is in a range between plus minus four points. So with a probability of 95%, your score is between 116 and 124. If the test was less reliable, which means that it's known that there is always a big deal of measurement error, the range of the confidence interval would be much bigger. So if the test had a really bad reliability, the psychologist would tell you, well, your score is between 110 and 130. And as we have to make decisions based on these results, it's highly problematic if there is such a big insecurity. I mean, for example, if we underestimate the intelligence of a pupil and tell him, well, maybe it's better not to attend this school because it's going to be too hard for you. This would be a terrible advice. And on the other hand, if we tell somebody, well, you are highly intelligent, you should join the Mensa network, which is for highly intelligent people who have an IQ over 130, even though his real intelligence score is about 120 or 125. So this could lead to too high expectations and finally maybe to permanent stress and burnout. So it's really important that the results of our tests are reliable. Even though we are going to hear of different methods to uh, estimate the reliability of a test or questionnaire, it's very important to mention that there's always only one reliability. Every test, every measurement instrument has just one reliability. It's the same with validity, which makes sure that the test measures what it's supposed to measure and that should not be confused with reliability. Um, a test can be reliable, so the results you achieve in this test can be reproduced whenever you take the test again, so it's reliable, even though it's not valid. So maybe you have an intelligence test and one and the same person gets the same test result whenever he or she takes the test. But in fact, this test is not an intelligence test, it's a creativity test. What it really measures is not intelligence, it's creativity. So it's not valid, it's not measuring what it's supposed to measure, even though it's reliable. But a test that is not reliable at all cannot be valid. This is important to realize. If your result of 120 points in the IQ test is the result of measurement errors, you are not measuring what the test is supposed to measure. You're not measuring intelligence. Like I said in the beginning, there are different methods to estimate reliability. One very common method is the so-called retest reliability. All you do is present one and the same test for two times. So you have maybe 
300 participants who took an intelligence test and maybe four weeks later they have to take one and the same test again. And then you just take a look. Well, those guys who scored at test time one very high are those the ones who scored very high at test point two as well. And if there is a high correlation, this is a good sign for the reliability of the test. But now you might wonder, isn't it problematic if the trait we measure isn't stable? If intelligence was drastically changing over time? Well, a systematic change in intelligence is no danger for the so-called retest reliability because if everyone becomes five points better, there will still be a high correlation between test one and test two. But if there are differential effects, so one gets better just one point and the other one gets better seven point and the third one is maybe getting worse. So this would be a threat to the correlation between test one and test two. And we would underestimate the reliability of the test because the test itself isn't influenced by measurement errors, but the trait we measure is just instable. In case of intelligence, this is not a big problem because intelligence is one of the most stable traits we observe in psychology. For example, in the study from Deary and colleagues published in the year 2000, the so-called Moray House test, a verbal intelligence test was presented to people at the age of 11 and 66 years later when participants were on average 77 years old the test was presented again and there was an impressive correlation between the results they scored at the age of 11 and the results they scored at the age of 77. So intelligence is a quite stable trait. What about other traits? For example, the so-called big five, extraversion, agreeableness, openness, conscientiousness and neuroticism. Well, there is a quite interesting meta-analysis from Del Vecchio and Roberts, published also in 2000, in which many studies with thousands of participants had been reanalyzed and by keeping the age of the participants and the retest interval constant, um, the retest interval was kept constant on 6.75 years, Del Vecchio and Roberts observed that extraversion, which means you have no problems with being in the center of attention, extraversion had the highest retest correlation and the lowest retest correlation was observed for neuroticism, which is about worrying too much and thinking about, well, what are the other guys thinking about me if I do this or that? And neuroticism was not that stable. But to be true, it was only a small difference in comparison to the other big five factors. And obviously, in comparison to intelligence, the retest correlations for the big five personality factors were clearly smaller. <laughs>